Welcome all to the Unifying Force. I am Catherine and Gio. Hey, I'm Gio. On this show, we discuss the philosophies of Star Wars and how it relates to our own lives and how it relates to other lives and world histories. Today, we will be talking about the origins of the Force. Mm -hmm. Probably our best. We'll do so our best. So, would you like yeah. to take the lead on it, Gio? Uh, sure, let's get right into it. So, hey, everyone. Um, good to see you. Hopefully this is the first of a series and we are focusing, as Catherine just mentioned, on the origins of the force. Um, and there are two big aspects to our conversation today. One can be looked at as the behind the scenes creative side from George Lucas when he first had the ideas of Star Wars, the galaxy far, far away and the force and how it connects everything narratively in terms of characters and then thematically. And then also how it relates to us in our real world uh, in terms of spirituality, philosophy, world cultures, world religions, um, and different communities and peoples. And what we thought would be a good idea is to have a title for a, a video series where um, uh, unity and equality is promoted uh, at the very beginning. Um, so there's an old expanded universe, Star Wars fiction before Disney acquired it and started the new canon stuff um called the unifying force it's the final book in a in a great series of books called the new jedi order um and it essentially is the concept of the force but in sort of a dissertation level can how everything connects to everything and how it all works so we thought it would be a good catch-all title um and uh we're gonna try and i guess chronologically go through it is is one way to do it so um, starting with the Force, what is it? Um, how did George Lucas come up with it? Uh, was he inspired by A, B, and C? And does it resonate with us for X, Y, and Z? Yes, and as a spread for Star Wars, of course, George first started coming up with these ideas when they were based out of San Francisco with the whole New Age movement. Where it's, uh, one of the universal ideas that we can relate to the Force is the idea of the chi, you know, the inner being, you know, mind over matter, finding yeah. your own personal self-worth in your lives. And the interesting thing about where the force itself, like the genesis of the term came from, is actually here from a direct quote. This comes from a short film by Arthur Lipset called 2187, which is a compilation of newsreel footage and vacation type footage and from the National Archives of Canada. And in the, this short documentary collage, this cinematographer Roman Kreuter says, quote, many people feel that in the contemplation of nature and in communication with other living things, they become aware of some kind of force or something behind this apparent mask which we see in front of us and they call it god of course as the end quote as we see george lucas of course gets these ideas of the force as this whole you know what is it to be oneself and like you go back to all of these old stories legends like uh you know sword in the stone even Mer you know merlin other swords and you see that yeah. A lot of these sort of mystical beings are there to provide guidance and sometimes they have magical powers uh, but that's yeah. not really the point at all the center of those stories. It's the idea of you're providing guidance guidance, and trying to instill somebody with more self-confidence. We see that mm -hmm. a lot coming from Yoda, of course, in The Empire Strikes Back. He's trying to base the message, the core message of what he is trying to tell Luke, of course, is that you just need to believe in yourself. Stop thinking about how difficult the challenges are. You have the force. Just embrace it. Much like Obi-Wan mm -hmm. will say that it's the energy that surrounds all living things. that surrounds us, combines us, and binds the galaxy together. If that sounds familiar, then it does tie into Taoism as well, which is not something that you can necessarily 
sum up in a single sentence. It's not a concept that you could just easily translate. No. It's the idea that you can understand the very fabric of the universe at, through your daily lives, through the very a- aspect of being, just being alive and living through your lives, you can gain these types of insights. And the whole notion of why the force I think works so well is because it is that universal theme you know it's not restricted to necessarily one culture and as Lucas has observed this is something that you've seen in numerous cultures and religions and stories for over 13,000 years which is something that Joseph Campbell also covers a lot which we'll get to maybe on a later show uh yes but how would you define the force in terms of our world world religions do you that's a good question uh and a great segue thank you um so In terms of, do you want the context of what I think George Lucas went for in 1975-6 when he was writing it? Or or do do you want my interpretation now in 2021? And you can give us both. Why not? Okay. Okay. So I think that uh, I need to do a bit more reading about George Lucas's behind-the-scenes stuff. I've I've touched on it a few times. When I was at school, I actually gave a public speaking exam lecture where you had to pick a subject that you're passionate about, and the subject was entertainment. Um, and I chose George Lucas uh, as the inspirational guy um, or girl, but it was George Lucas that I picked. And I, that's when I first learned when I was 15 years old, I started reading about how he grew up in Modesto, California, and he is from a particular type of, type of background and, and the types of people he'd hang out with. And uh, there wasn't much to do, um, but if you were uh, mechanically orientated, you could fix up cars and go racing. Um, so that was a very much a source of escapism for him. Uh, because he's a very practical person as well as very spiritual person Um, and that's what's great about the force the force has this kind of central unifying everything but it's about resolving our differences and acknowledging the duality of our existence and our natures uh, as individuals now as luke and leia and han and ray and kylo ren um, and anakin and padme everyone has these two maybe antagonistic forces within them, light and dark, good and evil, right and wrong, um, black and white, yin and yang, um, Miri and Piri. There are so many cultures around the world that have their own terms for this dual concept of everything. It's genuinely a theory of everything. Um, And I think George Lucas looked for escapism from his teenage situation. Um, he would go on drag racing, which was the inspiration for American Graffiti, which was um, a, a, it's another American cult classic um, and essential viewing if you haven't seen it. Um, I think that George Lucas, at the time of writing, I think, I, I'm not sure how many years he graduated from uh, USC, so University of Southern California, where he first had direct exposure to academia relating to metaphysics and world cultures. Um, and the, I know that uh, Gary Kurtz, the producer, had a lot of that in college and actually worked with Lucas extensively in mapping out how the Force should be presented in the story. It's like George, as we know, originally wanted it to be the Ashla and the Bogan for the light and the dark. And yeah. the idea that the Force was, you know, it's the force of others, the unifying force of other people trying to help each other and the like. But Gary thought it was getting a bit too lost in the weeds when it was getting a bit too detailed. And he's like, well, let's just keep it simple, you know, light and dark. So they dropped the terms as on the bogan and just focused more so in the first film especially on just the force that's um i didn't know that that's that's really cool to know um uh so was gary kurtz almost uh taking george lucas's spiritual exploration under his wing at the time was a he bit, yes because george as you know when he was writing the original script he kept going back to joseph campbell who was one of his professors mm. At USC and for those who don't know Joseph Campbell was a clinical anthropologist and he studied a lot about world cultures and world religions and how so many different cultures and religions separated by you know thousands of miles geographically or thousands of years will be telling the same stories over and over and it seems like oh they must have communicated sometime but it's not it's like these universal themes that people like talking about and so Kurt said you got to streamline this stuff because another word that fa- Star Wars fans will know that George had in the original script was the Bendu and the idea that the Bendu is sort of this unifying graph for the whole force. Yeah. And again, that's something that would come back in Rebels. But was Yeah, bit... the one in the middle. Yes, the one in the middle. Uh, but George wanted to very much uh, stick more to the light and dark. And that's something that Gary advised would be something that not dive in too much on the first film, but more on the second. 
and the whole that idea is that the force of trying to help other people, which of course is reflected in the Jedi's own philosophy. That's kind of what the Jedi are trying to do. Trying to it's like it doesn't matter if you are you yourself are not a force user if you adapt the ideology of the Jedi in your everyday lives. And if a lot of people do that, if the masses were to adapt that, then the world could be a better place. Which is a concept that's been featured in a lot of different superhero stories too. Uh, like uh, you know, Dark Knight Rises, or Bruce Wayne says the idea of Batman is like, yeah, not everybody could be you know the billionaire who drives around with all these tools and beating people up. But if everybody adapts the morals and the ideas of what he stands for, then the world's going to be a better place. And that's another yeah. universal theme. And you see that especially even in Star Wars. It's not like Obi Wan sends Luke through the gauntlet to learn how to you know do all these different force tricks. It's like yeah, you know, gauge somebody for their morals, engage them for who they are, and push them forward. Like Yoda, for example. He knows that that whole sentence that he says that, oh, do or do not, there is no try. Well, he knows there's literally a thing called trying. It's just the mindset. You need to see yourself in a the po- power of positivity. You know, yeah. see it, think it, do it. Visual, yeah, you know, visualization. Like when Yoda tells Luke, stop thinking about how, you know, the difference in size between the rocks and the X-Wing. It's irrelevant to your ability to lift it. Like Kylo Ren, you could stop a blaster bolt with his mind just because he knows he can do it. Uh, and so it's the whole mind over matter thing and I think that's also one of the reasons that the force has caught on for so many different people because it's such a universally understandable idea yeah definitely Um, I think that it's a concept that I remember hearing Mark Hamill in an interview say I think this was um, in the uh, run-up to the launch of the Phantom Menace so just following the the special editions in 97 98 um and i think it might have been a documentary on the vhs uh, special edition release in the late 90s looking forward to the phantom menace um and he was asked why why does star wars have such appeal why why does it matter why do people care and his answer was simply i think it's the the concept of the force that george came up with this this thing that you know, on the surface of it, it can be as shallow as a puddle. But if you really want to jump in, it's a, it's a pretty deep lake <laughs> and it keeps going once you jump. Um, and I just thought that was a great metaphor, uh, the whole kind of icebergian thing. There's a, there's a top that you see, it's very defined and quite small, but then hidden depths below the surface are endless and there's no way you could predict uh, how deep things can really run. And the force is exactly that. Uh, it's a... 20th century 1970s pop culture american west coast crossover amalgamation of the idea of uh monoculture in a way so the mono myth is the idea of some some story some narrative some characters are present in all art and literature and music and and creative expression from different pockets of humanity from different continents throughout time um, but i think it's also a monoculture so there is in a way, when we talk about different cultures, we're acknowledging our differences and how beautiful they are. But fundamentally, the tenets are unifying and they tend to be quite moralistic and quite spiritual, even if they don't overtly have um, a discussion of ethics or a discussion of morals or uh, discourse um, and analysis of spirituality and what it means to think and be and contemplate the existential wonder who we are why we are here what is our purpose is there a purpose does there have to be a purpose all of those things are all answers that people are um, perennially looking for every single day whether they are of a belief system or organized religion or um, maybe a a political group or um, a, a charity foundation everyone's looking for why am i waking up what am i doing with these 24 hours that i've got what should i do is it making me happy why Uh, and these are questions that people have turned to their original cultures um, and families and uh, ancestral heritage i'm so sorry um uh teething problems with the first broadcast um uh the idea that the answers that you have are within you I think is a really big statement to make and it's almost a cliche but what i've started to tell some of my friends and, and people within my small circle since the lockdown and the pandemic um we should embrace embrace cliches and things that are derivative and stereotypical 
you don't have to always try and be cool and edgy and there's a reason why things become cliches in in culture whether it's pop culture you know the good guy and there's an old mentor and that's merlin or that's obi-wan kenobi and there's a damsel in distress and that's princess leia um, although I would argue in 1977, Princess Leia is not a damsel in distress. She appears to be a damsel in distress, but very quickly George Lucas subverts that, which is one reason why I think Star Wars is the first major blockbuster feminist sci-fi. But that's another <laughs> subject for another time. Um, oh, and real quick, if, about... uh, if people are loving this, uh, you can feel free to ask questions in the chat and we'll get to them at the end. Yes, yes, I forgot to mention that. Um, we will, we can, if there are a couple of questions or more than a couple, we can dedicate some specific protected time just to Q&A stuff at the end. Um, so please uh, chime in at any time if you wish. Um, but it, it's, I think it's a lot of it is about empowerment as well, empowering the individual to realize a, a great purpose, a greater purpose, something bigger than yourself. So I think different people individually and then from different communities try and label this because it's nice to label things so that you can give a term that you can then discuss something with and say, hey, I do believe this or I don't believe that for reasons A, B, C or X, Y, Z. And when you have a concept like uh, a religion uh, or a belief system or a philosophy, you have an, a central organizing principle around which to base all your other behaviors, motivations, thought processes, uh, and hopefully analysis and introspection, discussion and evaluation, so that you're progressing as an individual, and then your immediate surroundings are progressing and improving in the wider community and the wider world. Um, so tying that directly back to Star Wars, the Jedi is all about uh, the Jedi Order from the very beginning of 1977 Star Wars, um, the moment Jedi are referred to, there is an air of mysticism. Um, there's an air of familiarity, but also mystique from Luke, from Mark Hamill's face when, when he's told. Um, and then when, when Alec Guinness says, you know, for over a thousand generations, the Jedi Knights were the guardians of peace and justice in the old Republic. So where does that come from? That That's an idea of a, a warrior group of people, um, a group of uh, honorable men and women from all over who are willing to defend and protect um, essential fundamental rights of every individual in a country or a world or a galaxy. Um, so you, they, those th sorts of concepts exist and they, they exist still today around the world and they have existed through time some of our history textbooks are really good at portraying and shining a light on hey you know the knights of the medieval times in, in western europe and uh, england and uh, merlin the knights of the round table and guinevere and those sorts of stories th white type stuff the once and future king is actually a novel i've been meaning to read for years it was first on my radar in uh um, the first x-men film actually because patrick stewart uh, as Charles Xavier uses it as a way of discussing with his students what it means uh, to have purpose and to have an identity. Um, and it ties back to Joseph Campbell and then George Lucas and Gary Kurtz about the monomyth or the monoculture and how there are certain stories that people always end up talking about and, and expressing in different media and from different parts of the world and in different languages. But the central tenet is similar, if not the same. There are um, unifying parallel strands that run through all these stories. And the reason why is because it's important for human um, progression, but also for human just daily existence to acknowledge that uh, there are these hard, cold truths that um, actually, if we think about, will really, really give us some warmth and light inside. Um, and I think if people start to realize that more and connect with the potential within, um, some might say a divine potential if you look at some spiritual groups and some spiritual philosophies or um, the concept of, as we mentioned, uh, Tao. So uh, Taoism is a fascinating field, um, but it's, it's difficult to discuss even uh, just talking about it now because our window onto things like the, the philosophy of Tao, um, things that Lao Tzu and Confucius um, espoused many centuries ago yeah, in the Far East, they have been recorded and translated and written mostly by people of a particular background who aren't of the original background. So some things get lost in translation. Um, and I've, 
I found it really fascinating in lockdown trying to go back to classics um, because I never I didn't study classics the way some people do it at college or university but I've always been amazed at how um, people hype up Shakespeare and Shakespeare is constantly just uh, name dropping Homer and Virgil yeah. and all these other great authors um, from a medieval Renaissance era um, Europe they started to really return to popular culture the renaissance was about rebirthing the ideas of these ancient epics and classics um, and all these ancient epics and classics the odyssey the Aeneid, metamorphoses they are all about a central character who goes on a voyage of discovery and he or she discovers something great about themselves that they didn't know beforehand but it's only through the experiences of daily life or of the grand adventure they are called to that they begin to learn facets of their nature that were always there but they were blind to and now their eyes have been opened and kind of the dark clouds of uncertainty of teenage years or of being a young adult or even of being a child and being lost or an orphan um uh begin to right i, I think dispel. that really yeah i think that really hits it on the head too because much like with luke being the original protagonist it's the idea of longing and wanting to go out and have an adventure in the world which is another strong theme in american graffiti and you could tie that very much yes. into the force yeah. in terms of finding your purpose. Like, what are you going to do? And it's the whole imparting, not just wisdom, but imparting your ethics. It's like, yes, you should be helping other people. The unifying force of others being brought together to, to make the world a better place. And mm -hmm. George even elevated that uh, quite a lot when he went into the prequels of the whole Metachlorian thing, which was inspired by Symbiogenesis, which is the idea of eukaryotic embryo cells and combining with proteotic cells to actually create life and create new cells. And it still roots back to the theme of other things, even the most microscopic and seemingly insignificant things coming together for the greater purpose. And that's true. Yeah, that's really good. I yeah, like that. Of course, some of that might have been lost into the translation a little bit of the movie, but that's okay. Uh, hey, they cut uh, out Liam Neeson's dialogue. Liam Neeson clearly had a lot more to say. Qui-Gon, tip of the tongue, the Jedi Council, they shut him down. <laughs> yes. Uh, so then also we see another theme as far as the Force. It's also through Buddhism especially in the prequels, you know, the idea that you are going to conquer your fears and get over your suffering as focusing on the me and the that. Stop thinking about all of your own personal desires. Stop face the fact that your own ignorance of the world has a lot to do with this. And this goes back to Anakin having all of his desires, how he wants to be, you know, go save the slaves. He wants to save his mother. He wants to save Patty. He wants to do all of these things. And yet, when he goes to Yoda for guidance, Yoda just tells him not to worry about it. You know, don't, if somebody, you lose somebody, don't mourn them, don't miss them. Because Yoda is very much, he's already gone on that meditative journey. We even see that a bit in Clone Wars when he goes to the heart yeah. of the galaxy. Yes, and he yeah. sees how a lot of these things work and how all these different concepts, like when he meets the Force Priestesses and it's the different types of personalities mm -hmm. coming together to form the one. And Anakin, of course, could not grasp that fully which is why he has all of these desires worked up. But as we know, that wasn't always, wasn't completely his fault either. But so no. you do see how this kind of, it is the universal idea of how the force is meant for trying to help other people and make things better, which is something I would relate back to a question that Mike has asked in the chat, such as, do we think the force has changed much from 1977 up till today, or do we think it has remained constant? What do you think, Joe? Um... I think George Lucas had a pretty sound idea in 1977 of where he was going with it, but it wasn't as nuanced and developed as it has been since he uh, was directly involved in the Clone Wars. And he had the opportunity through the format of animated television to tell pretty far out ideas in terms of mysticism and spirituality. For example, the arc, um, the Mortis arc, which I think is one of the most narratively important popular culture stories at the moment, not just in Star Wars, uh, because that those three episodes within the clone wars uh, encapsulate everything that our conversation has been about um and everything is very much pulled from all the great stories from homer and virgil um, but also from confucius and lao tzu um from from the way of the buddha uh, from Tao, um from dharma which is the the original name for Tao, actually um which is quite interesting we'll get into like etymology and origins of things in a little bit but um, in the same way that I mentioned the, the term that I just came up with today, the monoculture, the central unifying culture of the world, of all humanity, 
of civilization in all our beautiful different forms and languages and, and pockets around the world. Um, it's always evolving and progressing. And there are so many infinite intricacies because every individual has something great to contribute um, to these discussions and just generally. Um, in the same way, I think George Lucas has been good in not being static with his beliefs, but the central unifying concept and the unifying theory, uh, I think he had pretty down. And from what you just said, Catherine, today, uh, the Gary Kurtz thing, which was completely new to me, it sounds like maybe Gary Kurtz had uh, the idea of the force um, almost fully formed personally, and he informed George Lucas's own interpretation and exploration of the force just from the opening uh mentions of it in a new hope or star wars 1977 and each extra chapter of star wars the episodes of the saga and then the ancillary stories and um standalones as well as the animated features have given more time within the world for the world to be built up in the same way that tolkien had something great with the hobbit but it was only with the lord of the rings when he really went to town i think george lucas had incredible themes in a new hope and i watched a new hope actually um on the final sunday of april so just before may the 4th we all did the whole house we loved every single second and we wanted to pause it and just reflect on what um alec guinness says but it's so well paced the way he just delivers these huge kind of truth bombs to luke that he's not really thought about before he's been selfish he's looking uh, out to the horizon to the next new adventure you know, never concentrating on where he was, what he was doing, as Yoda says um, in The Empire Strikes Back. Um, in the same way, every young person, in a way, whether you're restlessly energetic or you're very mellow, um, we, we don't necessarily stay in the present very well. But all of these ideas are about being in the present. It's very Zen. And that's, what, that, that's where I think the Eastern philosophies of Dharma and Tao um, very much influenced Maybe Joseph Campbell. I haven't read um, A Hero with a Thousand Faces, um, and uh, but I do have a copy of it actually right here on my stack of books that I'll, I'll preview at the end uh, as reading for next week, uh, for me, not for you guys. Um, and uh, But I think that he had a central idea um, in essence. So yeah. TLDR, he had the idea, but it's developed a lot since then, but nothing has really con contradicted what he originally set out. Yeah, I don't think it's radically changed much because that whole universal theme of wanting to help others and believing in yourself has still been there. But I think he's yeah. gone back to some of his original notes and has pulled other things that he has that has been left dormant for a while, such as the uh, the bendu, the idea of the one in the middle, the idea of you know in Eastern religions you very much have they accept the fact that there can be the light of the dark, the yin and the yang. You don't see that yeah. a lot in Western religions. In Western religions, it's like okay, there's all this good in heaven, there's all this evil hell. It's one or the other. Whereas, in, as we learned later on in Star Wars, uh, that's how the Jedi started out as well. You know, we saw at the first Jedi Temple, the yin-yang symbol. It's the idea of being at one, it, being at peace with the light and the dark side of yourself to counterbalance it so you don't lean too heavily into one side or the other. And that's, of course, an idea which goes back to George's original notes that he had on Empire Strikes Back for what Yoda's dialogue is going to be and how much do we want to dive into this and coming up with different terms, like, again, the Bogan and the Ashla, and he played around with maybe bringing those back. But they decided that ultimately it wasn't necessary because the whole idea of light and dark, not only is it such a universal idea, but it was so perfectly encapsulated with Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader as far as light and dark that you didn't need to apply all these extra terms to it. But like when Yoda, for example, going back to that storyline in Clone Wars where he goes to the heart of the galaxy, he gets to confront his dark side, like a literal confrontation of this dark goblin-like version of it and trying to basically yeah. confront his hubris. And that's kind yeah, of where definitely. a lot of the darkness comes ego. from. So that is something they added back in there. Same with the Bendu is being embracing something in the middle, whereas Luke in The Last Jedi it takes him on an interesting journey. It's not until the end of the film where he really realizes that you have to strike a counterbalance between the two. And that if you try and ignore and just say, oh, this doesn't exist, or I'm going to tap it out completely, then you can't ignore the fact that you have a dark side. Like Rey, for example, we see that she's not really afraid to tap into her dark side, but it doesn't take her to an evil place necessarily she's able to strike that balance there. Uh, yeah. And so, and again, going back to the whole metachlorians thing, applying a somewhat more scientific aspect of it. And so, yes, George, he does seem to bring different versions of it, but I think it's all different versions of the same idea. Like it's all working towards a universal balance between 
light and dark and between your own inner your own inner peace and all the other demons that you're dealing with in your life like don't necessarily think of as you mentioned like when yoda says think of the here and now don't think of the future don't burden yourself with all that take things in baby steps uh which is another st- a theme you could see running throughout the whole so- skywalker saga is that in the prequels the jedi are very much thinking too much about the future they're thinking about the government they're thinking about the war how are we gonna you know get through this and they're very much a western religious idea that it's more you know they got their whole little institution if you will they're not really in Mm -hmm. touch with the forcers qui-gon is a much more spiritual character which is why it's very deliberate in the phantom menace that he keeps mentioning uh the idea that you have to trust the force and he says this type of stuff over and over again because Mm -hmm. lucas is trying to emphasize the fact that because chronologically this is the first chapter in the story that this is where the audience should really be thinking don't pay even though yoda may be the grandmaster clearly Qui-Gon and him being much more at peace with himself and thinking about I mean yes you could say the chosen one prophecy is thinking of the future but he's not trying to map out Anakin's entire destiny you know lickety split uh so yes I think so in the short version I guess for summing up Mike's point is that uh I don't think it's changed that much it's just that you keep he keeps going back to his original notes and taking different pages out of those religious texts if you will to keep layering it Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's it's very much the Shrek onion philosophy of layers, <laughs> um, because yeah, he uh, obviously must have tomes and tomes and stacks of notes um, when he was studying and when he was exploring Joseph Campbell and then um, everything within Joseph Campbell's works about the monomyth, uh, the call to adventure, uh, the hero with a thousand faces, which I think is an amazing term that people should know about in schools. The hero with a thousand faces should appeal to everybody because uh, that's pretty much an exp- a, a summary of how Marvel have changed cinematic landscapes forever. They've put a hero with a thousand faces in all their successful Marvel films in the MCU, and people relate to the human, not the person wearing the helmet, the human behind the the hero. Um, and so it doesn't matter how the hero looks or what language he or she speaks or what their beliefs are. It's what you physically see them do in the film within those two hours, whether it's an origin story uh, and you see them struggle with very, very grounded, raw difficulties, the way Luke struggles in The New Hope. Um, And he very much struggles in Dagobah and he continues to struggle with throughout life. I think maybe one aspect of um, the Star Wars films that I feel might have been missed by some people, and I, I haven't spoken to every fan, so I have no idea if this is true, but a little hot take assumption coming right up. I think the reason why The Last Jedi is so controversial for many reasons is the fact that Luke Skywalker's character narratively goes a very different direction to the way lots of people assumed it should go. And that, to me, was very jarring when I watched it, but I liked it because it wasn't um, just the route to a perfect human being, a superman, an ubermensch type person who had all the answers all the time, because that's not interesting narratively. Um, And also that's not very realistic. Um, Luke definitely at some point became a deity of the force um, and he was probably almost all powerful. Um, And he became, you know, the son of the chosen one, maybe the the current chosen one. And you you see that. um, Are we allowed to talk about the end of the Mandalorian season two? It's been long enough, right? Sure. <laughs> um, uh, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the most important TV show of 20, 2020, um, uh, the, the end of The Mandalorian, where you finally see Jon Favreau and Dave Filoni have uh, envisioned the Luke Skywalker of old, of your, of our expanded universe from the novels and the games and the graphic novels um, and all the merchandise where Luke is all powerful and he's got the green saber. Um, and he's a paragon of man and woman and humanity. He's the perfect Jedi Knight and Jedi Grandmaster. Um, and those dark uh, dark troopers who tossed around our main new guy, Din Djarin, as if he was a can of soup, um, get completely sliced and diced. And it's all because Luke is entirely accepting of his identity and who he is. And he is truly in harmony. Um, I think the choreography... Uh, and the way the way act, the way actors move in Star Wars is actually incredible. Um, I know that there have been performances or live screenings before the pandemic of Star Wars where uh, there's no audio, 
So people would go and watch a, a film screening in a concert hall, maybe, and there'd just be a live band or live orchestra uh, play the music. Um, and maybe the subtitles are on screen, but there's a lot of great visual everything in Star Wars. George Lucas is a very visual and auditory director, um, maybe not so refined with some of the dialogue and writing speech, but that's different. Um, luckily, I think everything he wrote in the scripts that made it into the saga films, the main original six films, in terms of the force, I wouldn't change anything. I think that it's great. It's very clear. Um, it's the Mark Hamill phrasing of it's as shallow as a puddle or as deep as a lake, whatever you want it to be. Um, you can hear the dialogue and move on or have fun or just chug the popcorn and keep going or you can think about it right. afterwards. Right. Um, like, and I think what you were mentioning also about Luke being the, you know, the very much essence of a Jedi and the Mandalorian is that uh, it, it kind of goes back to the whole arc of the Force and the way it's interpreted in the three trilogies. Like in the prequel trilogy, it's that very Western religion idea of one or the other. You have to eradicate the other side, like stop it, no dark side, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. In the second trilogy, the original trilogy, we have Yoda and Obi-Wan seemingly benefiting from their exile because they're trying to teach Luke just the basic tenets of the Force and what it is, like we were talking about earlier. And then in the third trilogy, we kind of get to the whole striking the balance between the two and how that's actually a necessary thing to do. Because if you keep trying to stubbornly ignore one or the other, then it's just going to go on. The cycle is going to go on forever, which is ironic that of all people, the Dark Lord of the Sith himself, Darth Sidious, brought this up in Revenge of the Sith when he says, you know, Anakin one has to embrace a larger view of the world of the universe if one is to understand the great mystery not just yeah. the dogmatic view of the jedi which yeah. is of course hilariously ironic because he's a sith but yeah. it's still true and that you do need to understand this so luke yes in the mandalorian he does seem to reflect the essence of what he thinks a jedi should be because even though yoda and obi-wan were still teaching luke about the basic tenets of the force they were still very one-sided about it like ignore the dark side stamp it out kill your father this kind of thing and it takes Luke on a rather, it, it or requires Luke to undergo a rather traumatic experience for him to start really grasping Just a little these bit. concepts yeah. that we were talking about to push it, uh, to, to strike that balance. I mean, I know the term that they used to use, which I know nobody likes and I don't either, the whole gray Jedi thing, uh, it's still, that that is kind of the essence of what the ultimate force being I see would be. Sort of like the Bendu even. You know, he yeah, also I strikes think, a balance I, I, and is all, right, and all knowing. It's kind of building up to that. Also, yeah. you go back to, the Mortis trilogy in season three of Clone Wars, according to Dave Filoni, there are very specific answers for virtually every question you could possibly have about that trilogy. But if they answer those questions, it would defeat the purpose of that trilogy existing in the first place because they yep. want you asking questions. You see the son on the dark side, the daughter on the light, the father striking the balance between the two, that this seems to exist. Uh, this Mortis place exists outside the space-time continuum. And it's very, you could say it's perhaps an offshoot of the heart of the galaxy itself where all the midichlorians and the force pursues is and all of that comes from. Uh, and so I think that is a very interesting journey of the Force and how it's interpreted by different peoples throughout all three trilogies. Uh, and again, which is why that goes back to being such a universal theme and why it's caught on to become a classic. And that brings us to our second question from David O'Neill, who asks, uh, is there a timeline for how long it takes for literature or film to become a classic? That's an interesting way, that's an interesting thing, because I feel that there's also different definitions to classics. There's, yes. you know, the cult, you have the cult classic, which is something that isn't very widely embraced, but it has enough very memorable things in it to become a very niche type of thing. Like, oh, that's, a, you know, like uh, Clerks, for example. So many people have actually been a clerk <laughs> will we'll tell you how much they love that movie, but that's not something that's going to be completely embraced by the entirety of mainstream society to be, oh, that's a classic. You know, you're not going to see that, unfortunately, <laughs> on Turner Classic Movies. But anybody who's been a clerk and been to that life, like, yes, that is very much a classic that speaks to you. So you have cult yeah. classics like that. And that usually comes from something that has to be almost universally rejected at first, but kind of embraced later on. Then you have classics like Star Wars, where it caught on, like, immediately. Because when you combine the fact that you know, you had the Hayes Code, the whole morals code in Hollywood where no bad deed goes unpunished and from that birthed the noir genre. Well, the Hayes Code got repealed in the early 70s. All the old Hollywood moguls were retiring around that time and they had kept Hollywood to be a very closed door business. And so once all of the, you know, com uh, you know, corporations started buying the studios, they opened the door to more people from outside of Hollywood to come and join and be a part of it. 
And so it, and then it's also happening at a time when there's great cynicism in the United States and politics in general with the Vietnam War and, you know, the whole political administrations and all that. So you have kind of this conflagration of so much cynicism being unleashed, like so many filmmakers finally being able to uh, let it sigh out and let that, you know, all the frustrations with the Hays Code, not being able to tell the stories they wanted to, gave rise to one of the, the like the decade of the antihero in the 70s. But then it got a little too far. So once Star Wars came along, it's like a breath of fresh air. It's going back to a very, where good and evil are so clearly defined. And these, yeah. everything we've been talking about in the force is so easily graspable for people. So not only that, not only does that become embraced by fans and critics, it becomes a phenomenon almost immediately because it's taking also this neat kind of subgenre of, you know, old Flash Gordy type serials but updating it so that it seems a lot more timeless. And so that could yeah. be something that could become what you call an instant classic. And then there's things such as, uh, you know, maybe a certain actor, like years later after they pass away or whatever, and they look back at certain films and they're like, oh, that's a classic. But it is a term that gets thrown around sometimes quite a lot. But as far as uh, his follow-up question in terms of like, oh, how does a classic car relate to becoming classic or not? Well, I'll say things about classic cars is that it's sort of a relic of a bygone era. Like that whole culture from American Graffiti it doesn't really exist yeah. anymore. But that's really where all those cars come from, and they had a real unique style back then. And so that's something where you look at the car, and it's not just oh, that looks cool. It reminds you of a particular culture that doesn't really that's not widely embraced yeah. anymore. So that's another way you could view a classic. So something that could be either immediately embraced, something that's only embraced by a small niche, or something that is universal in concept enough that it's going to uh, catch on. So I think that's maybe one way you could tackle that question. Hmm. What do you think? Um, uh, I, I agree with you, um, pretty much everything that you were saying. Um, yeah, the idea of, I did actually think of a classic car <laughs> as well. Um, but that's, that's, uh, that's just because of, I've been seeing a lot of classic cars on the roads. Maybe people have been buying classic cars in lockdown or, or shining them up. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is actually a really fascinating and relevant, timely question that I am in a good position to give other people's answers to, uh, as well as my own at the end. Uh, because I've um, spent a lot of time in a couple of bookshops in the in maybe in throughout April. Um, I've been back in the bookshops big time, um, pandemically safe though. So two masks, two meters away from everyone, um, and I alcohol gel wipe everything that I've touched and so on. Um, I've I've been exploring the classic section as I mentioned. So um, I've actually acquired copies of uh, the Odyssey. Um, the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is regarded as the first classic and, and first great story, actually, in, in world literature, because it genuinely comes from the center of the world. It comes from the Babylonian era and from, the, um, from Babylon, so from the Middle East, um, because uh, people like Homer and the Odyssey uh, are considered the, the greatest or the first uh, stories or the first epics um, in Western literature. But the Epic of Gilgamesh, because it comes from the center of uh, Asia, the world almost, um, it, it's regarded as one of the world's first. Um, but w whether it's the oldest or not is up for debate because the evidence for those era of <laughs> writings, considering they weren't on paper, there was no print, they were on tablets and uh, recorded physically etched and sketched and, uh, and uh, physically um, marked into uh, walls and into stone tablets makes it very hard to verify. But I've happened to run into people who work in these bookstores or who are also in the same section as me, who happen to be classic students or classics academics. So I did say to them, hey, who does the best translation of ABC? And I would get one answer, I'd get a different answer and I'd see one of the um, options they suggested on the shelf. And I'd think, okay, I want that version of Homer's Odyssey because it looks great. Uh, and also the pages appeal to me and the cover's not too boring. Um, but there is a personal definition. There's a modern definition of what makes things classic. And we all use like, oh, it's a classic. You hear a great song. Oh, what a classic. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, uh, ACDC from the 60s, classic music, um, or you could say classic old music, Mozart, uh, Beethoven, Tchaikovsky, um, those are classical music pieces. But there's a defined era within um, Western musical history that's known as the classical era, 
where every single composer who writes music of that style is in the classical style, and every composer who lived and composed in that period of time, which is arbitrary and just fixed because some academics largely agreed on it, so it became published and became more and more published. That, that's how things are. We just pick almost arbitrary dates and we say, okay, from A to B is going to be known as period X, and from B to C is going to be known as period Y. Um, it's just a way of classifying things. And as long as no one judges one to be superior to the other, then it's all fine. Um, modern classics apparently are 25 years and older. And the reason I know this is because I actually tried to get a book that I called a classic. And I tried to ask someone, a friend of mine, a friend of a friend, um, I'm, I, I've got this book, I've just bought this new book. Um, it's not a new book. It's it's a book that I just newly bought off the bookshelf in the bookstore. Um, it's Captain Corelli's Mandolin. So it's a wartime story about a romance between a, a, um, a Greek soldier and an Italian, or maybe an Italian soldier and a Greek person. I haven't read it yet. Um, Nicolas Cage is Captain Corelli in a film that apparently is of not so great quality. Um, but the film came out, I think, 20 years ago. Um, and the book is at least 25 years old. So it is by definition a modern classic. But this person who has studied literature at college and university told me she'd never heard of it. And therefore, it's not a classic. And I thought that was interesting because that's obviously from her sphere of experience. Her, her worldview is she hasn't heard of it and she studied literature. So it cannot be a classic. Um, but when I was in the bookstore and I bought it, yeah, yeah, it was interesting. I, um, but that's that's modern classic, so it's a little bit different. Um, so classics, uh, I very quickly Googled um, as uh, uh, just as that question came up. Um, there are a couple of definitions flying around, but one um, that seemed to make the most sense is um, there's a humanities website called Thought Company, Thought Co., um, and they go into defining a classic as along central tenets of quality, longevity and universality. So if a text or an art or a piece of literature or a poem, a composition of music, a film uh, has those three central aspects that tick the boxes for you, then they are a classic in your eyes. And if they are of a certain time period where a frequent revisiting yields new discoveries and insights, then that is considered by the literary definition a classic. Now, the actual age of which when something is defined as a classic is up for debate. People who have studied classics or who are in academia and are scholars of these fields um, would say that classics are, I think, um, before the common era, so BCE, before the, um, the birth of Jesus Christ. Um, so it has to be, you know, X number of years old to be under classics. And if you look at university curricula, um, you can get your answer because just look at the things they study in year one, two, and three in different semesters, and you'll see Homer, you'll see Virgil, you'll see Dante. Dante is 13th century, just pre-Renaissance. Um, Homer is uh, classical ancient Greece. Um, Virgil is classical Roman. Yeah. Um, so classics uh, has a defined definition that's academic, which I've just mentioned. It has a personal definition, which is up to all of us, like the friend of the friend who was saying, no, it's not a modern classic because I haven't heard of it. Um, but I think the, the three tenets that they say, um, so quality, longevity, universality. And when you visit it again, it was, first of all, it's something that you think is good enough to revisit, whether you read it fully or whether you just flick through it or you read a passage or a stanza. Um, but it you reveal something fresh in you each time you go back. And yeah, that will continue like, to be... Sorry? Yeah, sort of like how uh, you know Cecil B. DeMille made the Ten Commandments twice, first in 1923 and then the more famous one in 1956. But because the his 1956 version with Heston just overshadowed the original so much, uh, nobody really considers the original a classic, even though it most certainly was of great quality for Cecil, you know, Cecil B. DeMille in the silent era in 1923, when you consider yeah. uh, what the quality of other films like that was like. But most people aren't going to go to that. You mentioned Ten Commandments. Oh, 1956. And, and I do find sometimes, like, that's interesting how those definitions work, because sometimes they could be jumbled around. For a good example, when Blade Runner came out in June 1982, it tanked. It was a box yeah. office bomb. None of the critics liked it. Liked it. They all hated it, blah, blah, blah. So then in 1992, Ridley Scott does the director's cut, and the two big changes were that they got rid of the jazz soundtrack, 
and they got rid of all of the Harrison Ford characters overbearing narration. And then all of a sudden the critics loved it. And it's like, well, the majority, if you go back and read the contemporary reviews from 1982, a lot of their criticisms of it are still there in, in the 1992 version. But because they changed two different aspects of it, it's like you're being shown something a bit, you're seeing it in a different way. So you're able to digest the inf process information very differently. It also helps when you have certain types of critics who will jump, popular ones who will jump on, sort of creates, you can, they'll put out a simple opinion on something and then a bunch of other critics who want to get into that guy's circle will then jump on that bandwagon for the sake of, uh, and then all of a sudden it becomes, oh, classic. But then it, then you sit back and ask, it's like, well, is it really? You know? <laughs> so so hmm. it, yeah, it, it is interesting how they play around, like, kind of like classical music. It's like, it seems anything from back then, Johann, Braun, Beethoven, whatever. I mean, those are the popular big names everybody hears, but it's like, oh, it's a classic. And it's like, okay, but does, does everything from there qualify as a classic? So it is very subjective, I think, comes down to it a lot. Yeah, it's completely subjective. Every, every single thing that we discuss here, everything that we watch, everything that we uh, reflect on, it's all subjectivity, but that's okay. We, we can strive to be objective, but we need to acknowledge a bit like light and dark, um, we will always be subjective. So we can strive for one thing, but acknowledge and not be afraid of knowing that inherently within human nature and with the physical experiences that we have, what we read and see and hear and taste and smell, our perceptions will always be subjective because we associate them with memories and thoughts and feelings which are intangible and they are only relevant really to us. Where we can connect with others is I think when we create something which resonates in some way and it can resonate on a physical sensation level that film was incredible visually i was blown away that moment when the horizon came in at the end just before the end credits it reminded me of the first time i saw the sunrise when i was six years old um, over the rocky mountains uh, that someone has that experience and they see it in a film and it reminds them of something that nostalgia but that also emotional memory connecting it to a visual experience they had um, is reflected in something they see on a film and they'll always remember it. I think that might be why the binary sunset in a grandiose but perfect way um, when Luke looks out onto the horizon and he's just had the difficult discussions with his uncle and aunt and with Obi-Wan about leaving everything. He's felt the call to adventure. He's denied it. He's saying, no, look, I've got work to do. Um, even though he wants to go to Toshi Station and pick up some power converters. Um, he can waste time with his friends when his chores are done. You know, he's always finding these little trials and tribulations that um, young adults will always come across, um, especially when we're in our, um, uh, we're in privileged situations where we have parental figures or we have a job or uh, we have the, the opportunity to hang out with friends. Um, anytime that freedom is denied when you're young, it feels like, oh, they're imprisoning me. Why, why, why won't uncle and aunt let me do what I want? Um, and then I think that's how Luke ends up really coming to his identity. It's in that scene where you have um, the force theme play over the binary sunset. Um, he starts to realize maybe there's something else between the two suns that he can see beyond the horizon that's in front of him. And I think that's what the unifying force concept is all about. And maybe that's what, you know, Zen, Dharma, Tao, um, uh, Western, Abrahamic organized religions, uh, Christianity, Jew, um, uh, the Jewish faith, Islam. Um, and then obviously uh, the, um, the, the way of the Buddha, Tao, um, the Sikh philosophy from South Asia. These are all Dharmic beliefs but they, they are parallel to the Abrahamic religions um, and they are parallel to George Lucas's conceptualization of spirituality in the force. And it was down pretty well in 1977. I really do want to someday talk to a fan who watched A New Hope, um, not knowing anything about maybe religion or spirituality from an agnostic or maybe completely atheist background. And then if there's still a fan in 2021 or 2022 when celebration happens, this is probably something that we could do in real life. Say to them, hey, how has your experience changed? And did anything in Star Wars ever resonate to an extent where you thought, hey, I want to look up that? Or I want to know why George Lucas says that? Or why do the Jedi think this? 
And if the average person, a, a regular fan, says, yeah, I started looking up um, what Zen things are, or when Qui-Gon says to Obi-Wan in The Phantom Menace, you know, um, you can think of the future, but never at the expense of the moment. Uh, you must be present. That stoicism is something that Marcus Aurelius and Seneca explored incredibly well in literature that's recorded, but it's not new. They didn't invent it. That's, that's going to have been around since humans had the idea of self and being able to think as individuals. Um, and we'll always have the idea, even if we go to an Elon Musk style onto Mars, fully cyborg, cybernetic implanted, uh, never driving anything ever again, AI doing everything, <laughs> never, ha never handling money. <laughs> yeah, you know, a real Blade Runner, cyberpunkian type future is very much on the horizon potentially. And we arguably are already in our dystopian hell because of the pandemic and everything. Yeah. But um, there's always hope. And that's what A New Hope was all about. Yeah. And that's what Star Wars has always been. Yeah. And that's what it really resonated with me first when I saw the first Star Wars film. Yes. And the last thing I'll mention now as we get at near the end now is that. Uh, When Star Wars fans say, may the Force be with you, it's not just a fun way to acknowledge that, hey, you're a Star Wars fan, but given everything that we said of what the Force is and how universal that is to everybody, then you're kind of wishing somebody inner peace. Wishing, it's something you can actually practice. Like, you don't need yeah. to have superpowers to understand the Force or necessarily yeah. practice those things. But yeah. then again, we have seen people do some pretty supernatural type things, like people can hold their breath for like eight minutes without batting an eyelash. Or like those monks who yeah. set themselves on fire to protest the Vietnam War who did not even flinch. So yes, there are certain ways that you can really try and embrace that type of inner power. But that's yeah. what I really love about the Force is that it is a universal concept that everybody can understand and relate to in their own lives. And so I think that's a really great uh, point to close on as we mm. now reach the end of this episode. Uh, we, Gio and I will be back two weeks from now on Sunday, May 23rd, uh, 8 a.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. GDT. Uh, be sure to come back here next Sunday for another episode of Jedi Archives when they get into the second issue of their comics. It's a very fun mm. show. Please do, yeah. Have, uh, yeah, I've been liking that one a lot. And then, of course, Virtual Cantina every Tuesdays at 4 Pacific and our watch-alongs Thursday nights at 6.30 Pacific. So, yes, make sure to join us for that. And, uh, yeah, I had a great time talking about this today, Gio. I'm glad we got to launch this show and very much looking forward to the future of it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks for everyone hosting uh, Virtual Cantina, Jedi Council, Star Wars Celebration 2022. Everyone involved, that will be too long to list and thank. Um, I'm going to end this Oscar speech prematurely by just saying that uh, if anyone's interested in reading further, I always thought that a great TED talk or a great lecture at university or a, even a good documentary should have a bibliography that you can quickly see. So for next time, if you're interested, and this ties in well to Jedi Archives, um, Tales of the Jedi. Uh, is something that I acquired uh, just two months ago and I am so excited to read it because it is the beginning of the Force mm -hmm. from Star Wars' oh, perspective and, and uh, Dawn of the Jedi. So these are things that I'm going to flick through over the next week um, and in, in two weeks' time, hopefully when we're back, um, I can give some, um, some reflections on, on what I experienced yeah. and, and hopefully recommend them as uh, excitedly as I want to right now. <laughs> And one more thing I'm going to plug is uh, our virtual cantina merchandise at T Public slash virtual cantina. We have oh, all yeah. sorts of great t-shirts there. We have one for Jedi archives, one for the unifying force show. Uh, and we have some other fun little catchphrases as well. My shirt's out right now, Cookopedia. We have uh, and Yoda, whatever. And then we have our classic virtual cantina and virtual cantina happy hour shirts. So check that out. That's great merchandise at T Public slash virtual cantina. Thank you. Thank so, you for reminding me because I, I wasn't actually aware of um, that availability was still on because i know that oh, sometimes yeah. these great little designs they, they can sell out quickly um so if you do like them please support them if um or think about it check out those designs they look really cool and some really good hard work has gone into them by some very talented people all right i guess that is uh, that is the show and we will see you all in two weeks and ever jedi archives next week okay this is the way thank you very much may the force be with you and we'll see you next time for the unifying force part two Bye.